Uh, good evening, listeners out there in Radio Land. This is Metropolitan Scalarius. Welcome you once again to our little show called Theology on the Air. This evening we're going to discuss a very interesting topic that um, is um, appropriate to this particular feastal season. And what we're going to discuss this evening is the concept of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And i like to begin by expressing that the, uh, the Feast of All Saints Day is something that is celebrated by both the Eastern and the Western churches. However, they are celebrated at different times of the year because historically, uh, All Saints Day uh, has been observed the Sunday following uh, Pentecost. At some point in history, the Latin Church moved it from the day at the Sunday after Pentecost to the month of November. But both of them commemorate this very important uh, date, and because it gives us the opportunity to um, remember all those who have died for the faith as well as all of those who have died in the faith. And so those who have died for the faith are, are called all saints because we have no way of knowing all of the saints in the church that have given a life for the faith. By uh, in a similar way, we have no way of knowing all of those faithful who have died in, in the faith and who continue to pray for us from uh, above. And so in this uh, podcast, we like to investigate these things, and we'd especially like to investigate such things as the association with uh, All Hallows' Eve, as well as the uh, practice, a very venerable practice uh, called the Day of the Dead, which is a Mexican celebration, as well as some other Spanish-speaking countries around the world. So this evening, we have our bishop from uh, our Archbishop from Toledo, Ohio, our Archbishop Mark Dowett. We have our our, bishop, our Archbishop of Washington D.C., Archbishop Cyril Mark. We have our bishop from Tallahassee, Florida, Bishop Anthony. We have our brother, uh, Archbishop Gregory, from Toronto, Canada. And this evening we have with us His Grace Obispo uh, Lupe Ruiz, who is the bishop of the Diocese of Verona in Southern California, which is east of Los Angeles. And so this evening we'd like to begin by asking Mark Dawit to uh, give us his his uh, knowledge on the Feast of All Saints and All Souls. Greetings, Mark Dawit. Greetings, and gr- greetings to everyone who's listening as we have another opportunity to study the Feasts of the Church and the theology connected with them. Uh, the uh, th- three days linked together with the All Hallows Triduum or Hallowtide, in the in the in the old old way of speaking, uh, consists of Halloween, October 31st, All Saints Day, November 1st, and All Souls Day, November 2nd. Now those are the the dates in the in the West. Um, the we have to remember that uh, every holiday, every every Sabbath, every every uh, occasion began the evening before preceding it. And so All Saints Day, also known as All Hallows Day, was preceded by All Hallows Eve. And as the words became compressed, it became Halloween, the, the first of the three days. And All Saints Day uh, uh, gives, gives a, a celebration of the lives of those uh, who died in faith, and All Souls Days uh, gives a, a prayer for those who died in faith, uh, 
but without being uh, known to be in the presence of God yet. Uh, so it, that immediately takes us to a, uh, the concept of the three parts of the church, the body of Christ being made up of uh, us on earth, the church militant, the pilgrims making their way toward heaven, the church suffering, uh, which in, in Western thought would be those undergoing some form of purgation, or in Eastern thought, those who are stopping by the toll houses after, after death, a little bit of, 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 of a torment. And finally, the church triumphant, those who have passed through all of that and are currently in the presence of God and who are able to offer intercessory prayer for us. Um, the uh, practice of praying for the departed is part of the apostolic church, the Catholic, Orthodox, and old Catholic churches. Not too many Protestants do it. Uh, in, in Protestant theology, it's almost as if there's a, a policy of you're on your own after uh, with, with all your, your work toward salvation uh, being taken care of before your death, hopefully. But not so in the apostolic churches. Uh, and this comes out of the tradition of the Jewish people uh, in saying what are called Kaddish, K-A-D-D-I-S-H, prayers. Uh, and upon the, the uh, uh, death of, of someone, the uh, family and friends get together and they say these prayers. Now, they've been doing this since the time of the Patriarch, it's not a, a recent practice at all. It's uh, almost an eternal practice. And they were doing this, they were saying these prayers at the time of Jesus. And there is no condemnation of the practice found in the Gospels or the Epistles. But rather, we have the parable of the unworthy steward, which is taught by Christ. And in this, uh, this parable... One debtor eases the debt of others, uh, and it's, it's a, a very significant teaching with regard to the communion of the saints that we can help ease the debt owed by others. So uh, we, can, we can safely say that almost no one departs this life with their slate entirely erased clean because we are always in the process of sinning and failing before God. The scriptures tell us that the righteous man falls seven times daily. Uh, so uh, all those seven times need an accounting for. And Jesus tells us that we will pay every penny owed. So the, the importance of prayer for the dead is underscored, and the, the apostolic church has always considered it a great act of mercy to offer prayers for the deceased, to go to the, um, the funeral homes, to go to the cemeteries, uh, to offer your prayers right there where the people are interred in the ground. So um, having, having eased our way into the, the reasons for these prayers, uh, historically it was considered that the, the uh, outgrowth of the Kaddish prayers were manifest in the Christian church, especially in the days when martyrdom was still fresh. Uh, and we were coming into a new age of martyrdom uh, where persecution is rampant in the Middle East and, and will probably spread its way into the West because we have not been vigilant enough against the, the agents of persecution. And, and, and rather, we've, we've sat idle on our hands uh, enacting legislation that will increase the penalty for, 
for uh, exercising faith. Um, Pope Boniface, uh, I know he set the date of the feast at uh, May 13th, and that was in the year 609 A.D., uh, which later Pope Gregory III moved to its current location in the west of November 1st. Um, the, of course, as I mentioned, the feast is much older, uh, dating back to apostolic days. Uh, I don't think we really can, can build a case for it not having been uh, a continuation of, of the Kaddish prayers and uh, receiving renewed um, devotion in the face of the martyrdom of the early church. So I'll relinquish the uh, microphone to the next uh, authority, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Archbishop Martel. That was very informative. And uh, I'd like to also point out is that when we talk about saints, that we're not talking about people who are walking around with halos over their head and people who've, who've never made a mistake in life. When St. Paul speaks frequently of the saints in his letters, he is not speaking of those people. He is speaking of those who human people who have their uh, flaws, their uh, personality flaws and behavior flaws, but who have such faith that they continue to strive to embrace the teachings of the Lord. And, and these are those people that we call saints. And with that, I would like to introduce our uh, Archbishop from Toronto, Canada, Archbishop Gregory. Greetings, Archbishop Gregory. Greetings this evening, everyone. I would like to just focus now on the icon of the Sunday of All Saints, which is an icon uh, drawn by the Orthodox Church. And in the icon, we see G our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ seated on a throne, high and lifted up, with a book of the Gospels in his hand. Above our Lord, there is our Holy Mary, Mother Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. And surrounding the Virgin Mary and Christ, there are a number of saints, and these saints could either be uh, prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, shepherds, teachers, and holy monastics. And these saints have lived holy lives, lives in holiness, and they've glorified God by their lives in whatever calling the Lord has called them to live. And some of the saints are named in the icon, such as Archangel Michael and other angels, John the Baptist. On the side of the throne is Adam and Eve, and they're bowing in reverence to Christ. And there are other saints in that icon who are lifting their hands to worship Jesus. In that icon also is Patriarch Abraham, and the story of Lazarus, and you know the story of Lazarus and the rich man in the gospel of Abraham's bosom and the rich man in hell, and how there was a great gulf between them, and the rich man tried to go to where Patriarch Abraham was, but he was not able to. And in the lower center of the icon, is the good thief who was crucified with Christ. The thief that Christ spoke to when he was on the cross saying, this day you will be with me in paradise. And below that is Patriarch Jacob, which is the father of the Jewish people. And usually the celebration uh, the Sunday of All Saints is celebrated with the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which includes Vespers also. And I would just like to share um, a scripture from the letter of Hebrews. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and the sin that claims so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And I think this description in the scripture is so uh, fitting for this icon. We must always remember that we are always surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us to be with the Lord and are interceding constantly on our behalf. And this is why we pray not just to the saints, we actually pray with the saints. They are praying for us, and we are praying with them. So we are in agreement to what they are praying before the Lord. And the scripture also says that we should lay aside every weight, heavy weight, you know, the burdens that we have in life and the sins that we are always falling into. Let's put those things aside. That's all part of becoming a saint, becoming holy as the Lord God is holy, and running the race that is set before us with endurance, and always looking to Jesus, who is perfect, who never sinned, the perfect man, perfect God. And now he is glorified before God his Father on the right hand of the throne of God. And I would just like to share um, a hymn of the feast that is celebrated during the Divine Liturgy. It says, Adorned in the blood of your martyrs through all the world, as in purple and fine linen, your church through them does cry unto you, O Christ God. Send down your compassion upon your people. Grant peace to your commonwealth and grant mercy to our souls. As first fruits of our nature to the planter of created things, the world presents the God very martyred saints in offering unto you, O Lord. Through their earnest entreaties, keep your church in deep peace and divine tranquility through the pure Theotokos. And I would like now to pass this on to our next speaker. Thank you, Archbishop Gervidas. That's very uh, well said. And I think it's also important that you point out the fact that these particular feast days or commemorations do have scriptural foundation, and that these are not something that the uh, liturgical churches have just made up, and that's really important for our listeners to know. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our next participant, Bishop Anthony from Tallahassee, Florida. Greetings, Bishop Anthony. Greetings, greetings. Uh, to all listeners, this is uh, just an excellent topic, and uh, we, uh, what better way to lead off here uh, from uh, our brother in relationship to the um, the icon, because what we are talking about here is all saints, and this being All Saints Day, or the commemorative time of, of the saints, we must remember that, as uh, Metropolitan had said earlier, uh, not just the ordinary, uh, they, these were just ordinary people, who uh, not, some of them not even given the status of sainthood by the church, but was nevertheless saintly communicants. And, and today, all Christians are reckoned as saints. Uh, and uh, this concept is uh, deep in the doctrine of uh, the communion of saints, or the common of saints. And uh, we find that all of the saints, uh, whether they were martyrs, uh, you know, um, any uh, conversion of a saint, uh, of of, of uh, an, an ordinary individual, uh, we are working constantly, and this reminds us to, uh, we talked about theosis, but the deification of ultimately becoming uh, or reaching sainthood. And this is why uh, the prayers are, are both ways. We pray uh, to the, the saints 
Um, and, and, and it's a common bonding. Uh, that's uh, the premise from which this communion with the saints is derived, is that we believe that uh, the, the faithful who have died, uh, uh, the, the expectation of Christ's promise of eternal life, uh, that uh, their prayers, and, and uh, assistance in our deliverance, and at the same time, uh, we are praying for them. It's uh, a communion, and uh, communion is a two-way street. Um, and these festival times are, are full of uh, its, its feasts, and uh, you talk about a high mass, uh, celebration, and commemoration. Commemoration to the dead uh, commemoration uh, uh, of the faithful who have departed. And our prayers is that they, you know, are, uh, uh, have gone into a more peaceful state. Uh, the other thing that we must always remember that as we celebrate All Souls Day, which is interesting in All Saints Day, is the timing, the timeline here. Uh, this is almost the, what we may call the climax uh, of the, uh, the the Christian year, and what I mean by that is that w immediately after we have uh, accomplished uh, these celebrations, we are right back in to Advent. Okay. So this is the end of the Paschal period. Uh, so there's a there's an end, but an end with a promise. Christ's promise of eternal life. And again, we we were then uh, recommemorated with the uh, remember the memories of the uh, the birth of Christ. And so this is uh, an exciting time of the year. It's it's a, a, a climax on the one hand, and it is the ultimate reminder again of the next Christian year uh, of the coming of Christ, um, who assures us that He will uh, come again for His church. So this is a communion of saints, and it, it is a, a high period of time, uh, uh, which is the promise that our Father will never leave us. So uh, we're, we're excited to be participating in this discussion, and we look forward to um, a summary at a later point uh, in this hour. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Anthony. Now, uh, that's very important that you point out two important facts. When you speak of the commemoration of saints, is that it becomes very evident that we do not become saints alone. We are a community, communing together with God in the world to come. And the second thing that you pointed out was that was very important. And St. Paul says it best. He says that those who have died in Christ will rise in Christ. And so when we talk about people who are saints, those who have gone on, those who have uh, been separated from their bodies and their, and their souls have gone on to heaven, is that they, will, that they will rise again because we do not commemorate or celebrate or worship a dead God, but a God that is alive. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next guest, uh, uh, Obispo Lupe Ruiz from Corona, California, who will give us some information on the uh, Feast of the Day of the Dead. Greetings, uh, Obispo Lupe. Greetings and blessings to all of you. And I will... I would say to, to, I will share with you two thoughts within the pastoral theology and the practical point of view what I experienced through my community that they celebrate uh, All Saints Day as, as well as Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos. And for two reasons, on All Saints Day, uh, they celebrate the saints they favorably are devoted to. And on those days, they really uh, light a candle and brings an offering to the saint or as a thing, as a thank you for all the 
benefits being received through him, for all the prayers being answered through him or through her, and all the favors from God received through his. And the following day, remembered the loved ones who departed to God. And then there are two, two thoughts in this. One, it is remembered with love, as a saying, we love you, we miss you, and we have our faith placed on God that you are in heaven. And if there is anything left within your life that there is a thing God did not forgive you, we pray, we intercede for you that you are taken into the kingdom of the Lord. Within this mind, in the Hispanic culture, we pray in three ways. That we pray directly to God our Father through Jesus Christ, and we pray for that beloved one who departed with mercy. And then some people also pray through things. Especially Saint Joseph, that is, that is much believed within the Hispanic, that is the saint that is in favor of you to intercede for you when you die. We believe that very strongly because in history we remember that Joseph died in um, in the hands of Virgin Mary. He died in the hands of Jesus Christ, beautiful day, to have such mercy and blessing from God with the Hispanic and Joseph as a person who will help in those moments. The third one we find a lot in hope in the Virgin Mary, because we believe strongly the power she has over her son. As we remember the story of the Cana wedding, goes and intercedes Christ and Christ never denies what she asks for. So within those three ways, Hispanics celebrate El Dia de los Muertos. We celebrate the day to remember those who are there and we consider them to live in such a happiness and perhaps they are there in front of God. And the last thought I would like to say that we are we are all we all are called to live holiness or to live like saints. And Christ gave us the formula in many ways through the to the gospels we can find it. I can summarize only one thing in Christ's uh, life, which is the holiness he lives. It is born from his complete obedience to his Father. His strong desire to please, respecting his will, and with happiness gratitude serve his father. So I imagine that we all could be living this holiness and these things on the earth if we could try to reach that stage where we completely obey what God had to say to us or wants us to do and respect that will. Through Christ we can serve like him with humbleness and gratitude that we are loved before we love him. I have that in mind only and to share to all of you and I'm happy to be sharing my thoughts of these beautiful days of all things and Dia de los Muertos. Blessings to all. 
Thank you, uh, Obispo Lupe. That was very important. And I think one of the important points that you make is that all of the feast days in the in, uh, in the church, such as All Saints Day and All Souls Day, is not separated from the uh, incarnation or the Annunciation because Jesus was the God-man, both human and divine. And so this is why we commemorate those who have gone on. And so I thank you for your contribution, and I would like to introduce our Archbishop from Washington, D.C., Archbishop Cyril Mark. Greetings, Archbishop. Uh, greetings. Uh, i like to just ask a basic question. Why do the Orthodox and Catholic churches uh, venerate um, the, the saints? And the answer is that uh, the veneration of the saints is nothing less than the wholehearted belief in the resurrection. Talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the detailed knowledge of all of its implication that goes along with the resurrection. When we think about the saints, and we think about them often and gazing at them, we consider their grace-assisted exploits. They could not have done anything that they did without the grace of God. And clearly the implications, and I think Mitch Ponty just finished speaking about the incarnation of the God-man, Jesus Christ, his resurrection and ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In short, the saints we see the, in the saints we see the promises of God regarding our nature fulfilled. We see our own destiny. And if we follow the example of our brothers and sisters that have been elevated to the sainthood and following their path, we, we know that we have an opportunity to become that, that glorious saint up there in that holy place. We have been commanded to be perfect. In this task, which seems impossible to the natural man, it seemed to be quite possible by the Christian who understands the resurrection and loved those who were wholly transformed by it, God's saints. We believe and confess that the saints are made of the same stuff we are made of. The saints struggle the way we struggle. The, the saints had temptations like we have. The saints had the same passions. Think about all of the saints of biblical proportions. Uh, Peter was a very hard-headed man. I mean, uh, uh, think about each and every one, every last one of the saints had some sort of sin or imperfection. But yet and still, we venerate them as saints somebody that we can follow in their footsteps. We are assured that they are in the word and dwelt by the same Holy Spirit as we are. And we stand in reverent awe of these holy ones who have fought the good fight and did the works of historic and heroic virtue. And also we are filled with confidence upon seeing the uncreated brightness of God totally suffusing and transforming the mortal flesh. That reminds me of when Moses came down uh, uh, from the mountain. His face glowed and his hair turned white. And, and that is what we call theosis. So I'll, I'll stop right there and turn it back over to the Metropolitan and have uh, closing remarks. Oh, thank you, Archbishop Cyril. That's uh, very well stated. And I think that it's important that we point out that the concept of saints is something that we are all in the process of becoming. 
And I think that on this particular day, which in America is Veterans Day, is another occasion to stop and think about all the saints and all the souls. Because we have men and women who have given their life in something that they believe. Most of them, we believe, hold the faith that we hold. And it's in this holding of the faith and in this belief that they will rise again. And so we'd like to thank all of our panelists this evening. We'd like to thank all of you out there in Radio Land for listening to us. We would appreciate your feedback and comments. Uh, please feel free to contact us at domesticworship at gmail.com. And with that, we give you our apostolic blessing, and we'd like to say good night and hope that you will join us again next month. God bless.